I've kind of had an obsession with World War II. That's Steven Spielberg, putting it mildly, who's had a hand in more than a dozen projects exploring the topic. You might be surprised, though, to hear that his first blockbuster, Jaws, did so before any of the others, though far below the surface. Stemming from his father's time in the war, in which Arnold Spielberg was part of the Burma Bridge Busters, and from the natural drama that war evokes, especially the biggest in history, Stephen has always been drawn to it. I really believe in this country, and I always have. And it's just resonated throughout my work. Wanting to tell American stories, I'm sure that sounds like I'm, I'm this kind of, you know, idealist or some sort of a, a patriot, but I am a patriot. When I was a kid, my dad was telling World War II stories all the time. His veteran friends would come over to the house and I'd listen to them tell war stories. So World War II, that greatest generation, became something that I wished I could be part of. He was envious of his dad's generation and their sense of duty and camaraderie, and their so-called good war as opposed to his generation's Vietnam, which he avoided as much as possible. I was obsessed with staying out of Vietnam and getting my grades to a point where I could retain my student deferment. I legally did what I could to not go. Whereas his father, among many others, enlisted within a month of Pearl Harbor. I enlisted in the Marines. Stephen has explored the topic overtly and covertly throughout his career. If you've seen some of my other videos, you might have noticed that I love the overlap between history and movies. But before we get to the meat of the matter, Is anyone eating this? some of the opinions I present are not necessarily my own but the prevalent ones of the time. We'll start with relatively surface level allegories. Quint represents the US military in the Pacific theater. Sensible, right? He served in the Navy, delivering atomic bomb parts to the Western Pacific. Before his ship was sunk by a Japanese submarine, he even owns an M1 rifle, the Quint essential American gun of the war. It also has a terrific wallop. George Patton described it as the greatest battle implement ever devised. He's the grizzled, stubborn sea dog who wants to macho his way to victory. But let's put a pin here for now. Hooper, a marine biologist, Is anyone here a marine biologist? symbolizes the American scientific approach to the war, specifically the Manhattan Project. What does he bring aboard? An air tank. You screw around with these tanks and they're gonna blow up that effectively becomes a war-ending bomb against the shark. That Quint himself brings across the ocean. This naturally makes the shark Imperial Japan, a sea power pursuing territory that's called territoriality, that is seen as sneaky, fanatical, sadistic, and who would not surrender, that also ambushes people off an American island. Does that sound familiar? December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. With its ubiquitous Americana and the incident that changes everyone's opinion that cannot be ignored. Coming on the country's birthday, Amity Island sits in for America and this vicious seaborne attack shatters its idyllicism and sense of safety just as Pearl Harbor did to the U.S. The peaceful In 25 years, there's never been a shooting or a murder in this town. Insular, Anytown, USA What is this? Anytown, USA realizes the greater world could not be ignored anymore. You are going to ignore this particular problem until it swims up and bites you on the ass! Which pretty much describes how Pearl Harbor became America's hinge point in the tug between so-called interventionists and isolationists. Now we finally come to the perhaps most nebulous figures, Brody, who wants to confront the threat. We're not only going to have to close the beach, we're going to have to hire somebody to kill the shark. And Vaughn, who thinks the problem has been exaggerated and will recede on its own. Amity's mayor, therefore, embodies the isolationists of the late 30s and early 40s, many of whom were in the government. Americans want no more war. Most of all, they want no more participation in foreign wars. While Brody represents the interventionists, specifically of the American public, the average citizens, you might say, who were ready to abandon appeasement of the oceanic menace long before the government. 
with his American middle-class family man idealism. Tell him I'm going fishing. Brody is courageous and altruistic. When the time came, the average citizen said, I will sacrifice myself for the country. He overcomes his aquaphobia to confront the threat to his home island. However, this is a problem too big for one man, i.e. one institution. The methods of Quint, the military, Hello. Hooper, the realm of science, and Brody, the American ethos, are not enough on their own. It requires all of them. Quint's boat and iconic rifle, Hooper's air tank, Brody's bravery and improvisation, and even Vaughn's financial approval to finally win the day. That's why we're gonna sign this and we're gonna pay that guy what he wants. Brody starts in one place, believing that individualism is paramount. But in any one man can make a difference. But learns that for a true crisis, cooperation is required. Just as virtually all parts of American society came together to win the good war. Before December 7th, 1941, a pro-war vote was expected to lose by at least three to one. But a day after, war was declared almost unanimously. The isolationists could only be persuaded by something undeniable that threatened their own livelihood. My kids will not be true. Sticking one's head in the sand and appeasement would not fix it. You might have noticed that the final act of the movie is almost a perfect parallel to the actual story of the Indianapolis. The ship is on a solo mission, sunk by Japanese torpedoes, stranding the crew in the ocean, but not before delivering the bomb that ends the war. We delivered the bomb. And the cherry on top? Little Boy has been described as a gun-type detonation, with one mass of uranium firing into another. Back to Spielberg for a little. In case you think he had little influence and was more of a hired gun director, you should know that he went out of his way to get this gig. He was immediately drawn to it, partly because it mirrored themes of his first movie, Duel, but also, I believe, because of its World War II parallels. Okay, fine, you might be saying, but he didn't have much impact on the plot or characters since he's not a credited screenwriter. It turns out that he had a hand in every aspect of its adaptation. Steven is one of a breed of filmmakers who must see every edit and live with a picture from the initial planning through the final release print. So I think that while his stewardship didn't intentionally add World War II connections, other than of course the indie story, they naturally spring from him. War of the Worlds was a very direct reference to 9-11. Not intended that way, but that's the way it turned out. So I think the world has a great impact on how it colors my movies. On the last day of principal photography, Spielberg fled before the final shot, fearing the crew would throw him in the water. From the speedboat pulling away from the set, Stephen shouted, I shall not return, which is a play on the famous Douglas MacArthur line regarding the Japanese invasion of the Philippines in 1942, indicating not just his knowledge of the war, but its ever presence in his mind especially during the difficult conditions of making Jaws. But that pales in comparison, of course, to the crew of the USS Indianapolis, for which Quint might be suffering from a form of survivor's guilt. In other words, why did I survive when so many of my friends died? It's another theme Spielberg tackled a few decades later in Saving Private Ryan. Quint sabotages his own mission, destroying the only means of communication, and later going full Ahab stranding them to the whims of the wild. He also dresses up, relatively speaking, as one might before an honorable suicide, which the actual captain of the Indianapolis did in 1968. Does Quint want to join his crewmates 30 years later in the same way? There can be a sense that the only answer to the internal pain is personal death, a resolution to the issue of having survived the original event. Does Quint think he escaped his fate? And this almost otherworldly shark has been loosed to rectify the cosmic oversight? That's a 20-footer. 20 25. Three tons on 